Hi there, friends. I'll come in here with a quick note to let you know that the first global product owner summit organized by the Scrum Master Toolbox podcast is coming soon. To know more, check out the uh, bit.ly forward slash product owner 2023. That's bit.ly forward slash product owner 2023. That's all one word, all lowercase. And uh, stick around to the end of the episode to know more. But for now, on to the show. Hello, everybody. Welcome to one very special bonus episode of the Scrum Master Toolbox podcast. And uh, we have with us today a, a very good old friend, literally, not just because we have met a long time ago, but because he recently had a uh, birthday, which came with the book. But we'll talk about that in a minute. Hey, Jim, welcome to the show. Hey, Vasco. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. So Jim, Jim Benson, also known as the author of Personal Kanban. Uh, he's been in my Agile universe since the beginning of my Agile career. Uh, I've read a lot uh, that Jim has written. Uh, he used to be more of a prolific blogger than he is now, but maybe that's because of the book that he's been working on for the <laughs> past few years. And uh, we've, we've met in many places around the world. And the last time we met face to face was actually in Seattle, where we had kimchi. An experience I will never forget. <laughs> <laughs> He's also the author of Personal Kanban, uh, a book that many of us who started in Agile in the late 1990s and early 2000s, of course, read. And he just published a book on collaboration. The book is called The Collaboration Equation by Modus Press. And uh, uh, we're going to talk about that book. And of course, a whole load of other lessons that Jim's uh, put in the book and otherwise. But first, Jim, to introduce the book to our audience, tell us, why do Scrum Masters and Agile coaches, why do they, why do they have to read this book? <laughs> why must you read this book? Uh, so I, I've been in Agile since it began. So I did my first Agile project in 1997, um, so a long, long time ago, uh, and uh, have since been in the Agile world, in the Lean world, in the software world, and in all other kind of verticals. So construction, healthcare, you name it. Uh, we've had the pleasure of working in it over the last 10 years. And what we found is that all projects that involve continuous improvement have kind of this lifespan where you start it and everybody's really excited and some things kind of go wrong and, and things fall apart. And it really struck me that this was an issue when I was sitting with uh, John Shook, who at the time was the head of the Lean Enterprise Institute, the guy who's famous for building, you know, the a3 model and and making that popular um and he said you know how do you make these changes stick and this was john shook this is like a guy that invented lean <laughs> talking you know to a guy that invented kanban and uh had started agile and we're sitting there going oh my god how do these things actually work out so this book is about a systematic way where we build what we call a right environment. And the right environment is uh, where professionals on your teams can behave professionally. You've set up a system where they have the psychological safety and the agency to act with confidence. And we've, we've released this many times now in many different industries. And this is kind of like our secret sauce about how we've been successful at Facebook, how we were successful at Turner Construction, how we were successful at the World Bank, et cetera. Um, and um, that would be why. That, that's that's the why. I don't know if that's a, enough and, of an empathy well, why. When, when, you th when you think about, like, uh, you, you said, how do we make these changes stick? Like, I'm thinking mm -hmm. as a Scrum Master and Agile Coach, that's kind of my day-to-day, -day, <laughs> right? Like, I'm, I'm working with organizations and teams to help them make the changes they want mm -hmm. stick, mm -hmm. right? So one of the things that is really puzzling for me is, if, well, if we got started in this journey, it must have been for a reason. Why don't we want to continue it, right? Like <laughs> when you think about your role, like coming in and being that change agent that you were talking about, like mm -hmm. what, what are the things that, that you know, block uh, our own self-determined decision mm -hmm. to 
make these changes stick, like adopting Agile or Scrum or Kanban or whatever that might be? So, so while I was working before COVID with Turner Construction and I, in New York, and I was there all the time, I actually had a class that or a, a working group that went for years where we puzzled out the role of the change agent. And just a few days ago, I did a uh, a weekly gym video uh, on Modus Institute, um, our online school. It was called, oh no, I'm a change agent. <laughs> uh, so every scrum master, every product owner even is a, a change agent. Uh, you are bringing opportunities for positive change to people who need it. They know they need it, but they're human. <laughs> and human beings are a real pain to work with. And you are too. <laughs> we all are because we're all human beings. So what happens when anybody brings a change to somebody else is they go through this very quick and faulty math about okay, I have to learn this whole new system. That's a bunch of extra work. I don't know how that's going to fail, but I know it's going to fail because everything fails. And then after a while, that internal dialogue becomes so noisy that they're like, screw it, I'm not going to do this. Um, the other thing that's happening is they're all overloaded. They're all being pulled in different directions all the time. And so it's not their job to figure out the rule set of this esoteric system that you're bringing. And when we're bringing systems like the Kanban method or personal Kanban or Scrum or something like that to a team, they don't ever fit the team, right? So what we've learned over the last several years is that every team is made up of unique individuals in a team creating value. So that is the collaboration equation. Individuals in teams create value. So, so are you then with the book and maybe through the book, uh, uh -huh. because uh, you've told me as we were prepping that the, the whole book in itself was an experience. Uh, I mean, writing the book itself yep. was an experience. Are you then through the book exploring what, you know, what we might call like the, the roots of why Agile even exists, not Agile itself, but why does it exist and needs to exist? Yes. Yeah. Uh, and so uh, why Agile, why Lean, why why any of the other flavors that are out there? Why, if any of these work, would we ever need multiple flavors? <laughs> uh, you know, why are there multiple process religions out there? Uh, and the reason is because we are searching for clarity. And these toolkits purport to bring clarity. And then we are we become frustrated as change agents when other people can't see our clarity. And if we turn that relationship around, they're sitting there trying to get work done and somebody is coming up and bringing a fairly confusing system that they are explaining in a very simplistic way to us. And we can't figure out how those things actually help us as individual professionals work together in our teams to get that work done. So what we started doing was starting up front before we do anything else, we do something that we call a right environment exercise. And that right environment exercise sets out and it says, okay, how does your work flow? What is the culture that you want? And how do you communicate with each other? And those are the building blocks for process. And if you don't know those things, then you can't have a process that works for your team. You can just have stuff that you do that makes it less painful to operate. And stuff you can do that's less painful to operate, whether that's Kanban, whether it's Scrum or whatever, isn't enough to keep people engaged. So w when you describe that, I'm thinking, okay, so you started, obviously you have a lot of experience and have worked with many different companies and teams within those companies. And at, at some point, I don't know, maybe in 98, 99, you started with uh, what at, at that time were called lightweight methodologies, right? Mm -hmm. And if you worked in software, then that was probably XP or, or FDD or something of the mm -hmm. sort. Or Rob or something. Yeah, and then Rob yeah. came up. Rob was never agile, I don't think. 
Uh, <clears throat> but there were many people trying to adapt it to somehow incorporate Agile, and they finally succeeded. It's these days called SAFE, but mm -hmm. <laughs> that was a, an inside joke <laughs> for those that don't know. In any case... <laughs> But you started with some framework is what I mean, right? Yeah. Like when you started your own agile career, your own agile yeah. practice, uh, you started with some framework, you know, personal Kanban, mm -hmm. the Kanban method, whatever that is. Yeah. And what I'm hearing is that you're no longer there. I am way no longer there. So so let's <laughs> let's go through this because I think it's important for us, <laughs> the older practitioners, <laughs> to kind of share. <laughs> With, with the rest of the community and those that are coming before or after us, like how, how did that happen? So walk us through that. So you started with, with, with what I expect would have been XP before you started with Kanban. Is that how mm -hmm. it started? Yeah. I, so the way that I started on my journey was my business partner at the time. So William Rowden and I used to be civil engineers and urban planners. And we worked together at a company called David Evans and Associates, which was a phenomenal engineering firm. It was a great place for us to learn to be collaborative initially. Um, we got a couple of internal software projects and we're like, how are we going to do these? A friend of Williams said, hey, I've got this guy I know named Kent and he's writing this book thing. So we got this pre-release copy of, of XP Explained and we're like, oh, this is cool. Let's try this. And so William and I were used to starting the planning process for like a roadway or a freeway or a subway or something, and then seeing the fruits of our labor maybe three or four years later, or like in the case of the Seattle light rail system, for me, it was 22 years after I drew the plans that the thing actually was running. Um, and we started making software. We're like, oh, my God, in two weeks, <laughs> we can actually see the fruits of our labor. And we were so deliriously happy that we quit our our careers and started a software company um but but Little we were did also you know at the time of course uh well did i know did i know that what i was getting myself into exactly <laughs> <laughs> well no so everyone all of us are are the beneficiaries and the victims of our own evolutionary design so exactly. when somebody asked me to talk about my career, I'll talk about going from being a punk rocker to an urban planner to owning a software company. And it sounds completely legitimately fluid when in actuality, I was like a pinball bouncing around in a machine. It's, you know, what Dave Snowden calls retrospective coherence. Of course. <laughs> but but if you if you if I write down my biography, I seem like the coolest guy ever when it really <laughs> I, was like going, I was like a Muppet just going, ah. Ah, you know, and of time. course, at that time, <laughs> software was the cool industry, especially in mm -hmm. Seattle, because the, the big software uh, Borg was right there next door. Yep. So so that's how you got started. You started with XP, right? Then yep. what came afterwards? Because obviously what I'm hearing is that eventually XP wasn't good enough anymore. So um, the, the kind of the, the evolution of this uh, is one day I was sitting in my office uh in in the u district and this guy just walks into the office and he's like looking around like he's evaluating our office i'm like what, what the hell is that and he says hey um you seem to have some extra space and i was like yeah and he said i've got this friend and he and i are trying to start this venture um his name's david anderson uh he's like um would you guys have some space for us you know, talk, talk to us about how we, we work. And, and we told him how we worked and stuff. And then, so uh, Dave shows up with like literally the world's heaviest laptop that I've ever seen. It, it must've weighed like 80 pounds. Uh, and we went out and he, he went through kind of this spiel of what was in his uh, agile management book. And it ended up that, that Dave just lived two, two blocks from me. And so he and I started to go out for, for scotch and uh, talk about how to implement the stuff in his book. And as we were do as we were having those conversations, the role of visualizing the work was there. So he had the, the, the color framework uh, thing that he'd, he'd done and some other things. And so we were talking about different ways to visualize work and uh, over this way at Milady's pub, uh, he and I drew the, first kind of Kanban on the back of a, a napkin. 
Um, and uh, uh, when we did that, he went back to Microsoft with his design. <laughs> There's a couple, you know, it took it took a year or so to get there. He he ended up never having offices in our offices and ended up going to Microsoft. Um, but uh, that's that's kind of how Kanban started. And Dave started it in the I'm in a big corporation and I have to do big corporate Kanban. But I started it with I have a team of eight people and we just need to communicate. And it's my team. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. So that meant that our rollouts of these Kanban ideas became very coordinate, but demonstrably different, both in terms of execution and focus. And what in, in like, when you look back now, like what were the, the, the key um, step steps away from what you had learned from XP? Like what, what were the things that you said, okay, this doesn't work. We'll, well do something so different. Yeah. So the, the thing was, is that at that time, so scrum was baby scrum at that time, but it still existed. And um, so, you know, we'd gotten CSMs and stuff. And uh, so we were part of the agile community, which at that point was largely undifferentiated. And um, the th first thing that became apparent was that time boxing was not a universal construct. And it wasn't, it, it wasn't uh, that, that it was helpful when it was helpful and it was definitely uh, a hindrance when it wasn't helpful. And it was already becoming kind of like this rule. You will always do things in iterations or sprints, depending that, on- Because that was also in XP at the time. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, XP definitely started with iterations and definitely helped us when we started our work. But what, what I always loved about Agile, the Agile people, was whenever we would say things like this, they'd say, well, you know, you have to start somewhere. You have to start with the training wheels. And so it's like, first of all, don't infantilize software developers. They don't need training wheels. <laughs> but what they do need is a coherent system. And, and the coherence in the system was overly coherent in the two initial methodologies because people got stuck in that two week framework and, and couldn't and let, break out of it. Let's not forget that when we started this, like not not just us, but the whole community, the whole agile community. When yep. when we started adopting agile, we came from a world where the standard process was overly uh, detailed, complex, and cumbersome. 100%. Right? We we came from yeah. the bureaucratic, uh, some would say paradise, and I would say hell of project management <laughs> as defined by PMI mostly, although 100%. there were other project management organizations already at the time. Yeah, and so, when... so Agile definitely happened for a reason. And 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 that's the thing that I, I don't think that people, A, give me credit for understanding, <laughs> and B, in turn, don't understand themselves, uh, is that we created Agile initially to break away from things like gigantic detailed design documents written by people who had never written a single three, line. Three of months code. of requirements writing. <laughs> yes. And then we went and built these teams. And now we've kind of recreated that same system. So now we have product owners who are doing all of this upfront planning. The rest of the teams are less and less and less involved in their own planning, except in sprint planning where they're taking vaguely written user stories and then trying to make some sense out of it. So one of the things that I do with any software team that I'm working with is I make them go sit with the end users. And if the end users have people that are relying on them, I make them go see them. So a great example of that was I was working with the Department of Health and Human Services in Washington State. And the two groups that I was working with there were one was um, uh, in charge of child protective services and the other was doing the software for vulnerable adults. So basically the same thing as child protective services, but for old people. Uh, and I asked them, I said, have you gone and worked with your, you, with your customers? And they said, yeah, we sat with the caseworkers every so often and watched them use the software. And there's the software was, you know, you can have something user friendly. This software was literally user hostile. <laughs> it, it was it, the, the UI was so so malevolent, <clears throat> and um, so what we did was we got the software developers to actually not go watch them use the software, 
But to get up at five o'clock in the morning, go to a coffee shop and have coffee with the caseworker and then drive around to the houses with the caseworkers to visual to actually see what the caseworker did every day. So that they could find out how this work smelled. Because I will tell you that when you go into a house where a guy has been in a big lounge chair and he hasn't been able to get out for a week, the house smells. <laughs> uh, you get to see the worst of humanity. <laughs> uh, and as Americans, we're really good at being terrible to each other. <laughs> uh, so um, they got to see that firsthand and realize that all of the people that were using their software, when they came back at the end of the day, they were just a basket of secondary trauma. And instantly they started figuring out ways to change the UI. Whereas before they're like, it's in that drop down menu, who cares? Yeah, yeah. They they had no yeah. empathy with their users, right? Which yeah, well, we we can talk about when we talk about process, because very often as agile coaches and scrum masters, we are implementing processes and, and we forget to do the same, which is say, wait a minute, I should be with my team as a human being, not as a scrum master or as an agile coach, so that I can understand how the process is or isn't helping them. And uh, at, at some point, of course, you wrote the book, Personal Kanban. So you had taken all of that learning and started to evolve your thinking about the systems that we need to put in place. Mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, and, and you wrote Personal Kanban. Now, when you look back, and again, using a little bit of uh, retrospective coherence, which is actually quite <laughs> useful from the point of view of summarizing and finding yes. the essence. <laughs> So tell us a little bit more, like what, what, what were the key things that you wanted to convey with that personal Kanban and, and how do you think those things reflect your evolving understanding of what Agile was really about? So Agile should be about paying attention and respect. And we need to recognize that, that you know, uh, that it isn't individuals and interactions over processes and tools. It's inter individuals and interactions through processes and tools because we use processes and tools to interact. Processes are just the, the definition that we have of how we interact with each other. That's what a process is. I, I promise to do these things so you're not surprised. We promise to have this information, blah, 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 blah. Tools, <clears throat> well, we all have Slack and Teams. We know how terrible it can be to have a helpful tool that we're not managing properly. So personal Kanban, why Limit Whip, Why Plans Fail, Beyond Agile, the books that came before the, this book were all designed in one way or another to help people find ways to respect the other people that they're working with. So uh, personal Kanban isn't just about like my Kanban. You know, it's not like, you know, my little Kanban <laughs> book, but, but it's about if you are overloaded and the people around you are overloaded, or if you have um, a lack of clarity in the work you're supposed to be doing at any given point in time, or other people can't see into the work that you're doing, then respect is impossible because you don't know what's going on. So, so what you're, what you're saying is we have to open the black box of the work that is being done before we can learn to respect the people we work with. Yeah. Oddly enough, when we go to work, we're there to work but we're still human beings. <laughs> so, we, so we there can't is shed that, that skin, that's for sure. Yes. Yeah, and, and we can't shed either skin. So the work requires us to do things and we're human beings that are now being required to do things that are either awesome or suck. And so we want to be very clear at any given point in time, what's happening, what is awesome, what sucks, and then have mechanisms in place to get rid of the sucky things, to make the awesome things more awesome, and you know, make standard work out of one, fix the other, but 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 you know, people are always like, I want to be heard, or I want to I want to feel seen, or whatever. Well, no one wants to feel heard. <laughs> it's just like, oh, I've I've been heard. I'll go home now. I'm happy. I've been placated. I was able to vent. It's you want for real the system that you're working in not to treat you like crap. You want a humane system. You, you want so, a humane system, which is lovely. I, I thank you for saying that because very mm -hmm. often when with friends, when we have a, a couple of scotches, maybe three or four already, by that time I start to think, you know, when I look at the world, I start to imagine that actually it wasn't the West that won the Cold War. I mean, think about this for a minute. The architecture these days is awful. It's all 
functionalist idealist architecture which we got from <laughs> thank god the Ro the soviet union of course <laughs> and i mean just walk around helsinki when you come here next time i'll take you uh -huh. to a few neighborhoods that look like they are from moscow um <laughs> And when you, when you think about processes in private companies, as well as in government, we see a, a, a sea of bureaucracy, right? It's, it's mm -hmm. the, it's the, 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 <clears throat> the revenge of bureaucracy on the free uh, thinkers of the world. Mm -hmm. And, and, and I start to think that actually a lot of the things that we struggle with are things that are the opposite of what we said we wanted to do. And even in agile, right? Like we call this lightweight methodologies for a reason they were called mm -hmm. lightweight methodologies before the agile brand word came along but these days in many cases the the light uh, is gone so it's just weighty methodologies <laughs> right oh a absolutely the um the <clears throat> where we lose um we'll just go back to a, an agile trope the definition of done. So Jim Benson being me, uh, my most popular tweet ever was software being done is like lawn being mowed. Um, uh, software is never done and your process is never done because both of those things are relationships. Both of those things decay over time. And just like any marriage decays over time, if you're not paying attention to it, you know, your team, if you got 15 people on your team, uh, that's, you know, hundreds of arranged marriages. <laughs> uh, and so now that most of us are remote in one way or another, we have to deal with this even more deeply. How do we want to treat each other? We need to be very explicit about that and then make sure that our systems are supporting that. So one of the things that comes out of the collaboration equation is we do this right environment exercise, we figure out the things that we need, and then we come up with visualizations for that. Not Kanban, Kanban's never enough. Scrum board, not even close to enough. Um, we want to have systems that help us see in real time the things that are important to us as professionals. And so we put that in a room that is called an obeya. And Obeya is basically one location where the professionals on your team can get all the information they need in order to act with confidence. This is a precursor. It is a prerequisite for any agile or lean team. And it's coming very late to the game. So what we were doing is we were starting uh, in the middle of the race. We weren't actually doing the pre-work for having a healthy agile team. And that's what is in this book. And uh, uh, I, I, I'm glad that we got to this collaboration equation part of, of your personal journey as well. Because yeah. one of the things that we, we need to recognize is that everything we build is built on something we knew before, right? Like you, you, you don't actually create anything. You just do a mashup of different ideas that we you know collect mm -hmm. through life and 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 kind of shape to the current reality right and one of the things we talked about in prep is the collaboration equation the book that you wrote is also a, a recognition that continuous improvement will eventually die and that's why we need to work on it all the time right mm -hmm. and we we talked mm -hmm. about evolutionary design and i'm thinking that I don't know if that's what the book writes uh, or or conveys because I haven't actually mm -hmm. read the book yet. But I'm thinking that one of the things that comes out of this is that we, as an agile community, we are also responsible for the evolution of agile. Yes. And and the question that I ask is, okay, so wh where should we take it next? And I'm I'm pretty sure you have a few theories and a few <laughs> hints in the collaboration equation. So. According to your own view, Jim Benson's view, and uh, what's in the book, what what are the next steps for Agile? So I uh, and yeah, you and I talked about this before uh, multiple times. Actually, is at the beginning of Agile back in the late '90s, uh, and uh, at the beginning of uh, the Kanban world in the 2000s, um, we uh, I, there were no rules. And so there was a lot of exploration about what things meant. Now there are so many certifications for all of these different things and SAFE has definitely created 
an entire globe of potential certifications that we're looking for people telling us how to treat each other. And that is not appropriate. <laughs> so uh, no two teams will ever have exactly the same process, even if they're doing scrum. So there's no right way to do scrum. And the way to think about this is if you have a team of seven people and three of them leave and you get three new people in, you're not going to do the same thing you did when those people left. And if you do, then your people are fungible and you're building something that requires no thought. So a lot of our work is about solving problems. Collectively. Or, yes, yes. Solving problems as the major part of your work. So your job, no one's job is to type code. And if it is, I got bad news for you. Chat GPT is going to eat you alive. <laughs> it is. It is. <laughs> <laughs> so, so your job is to say, what's the best way that this could possibly be done? What's the most innovative way that this could be done? You know, what solves this problem for the client in a new and unique way? That's what humans do. And that's when you become professional. You don't wallow in being a software craftsperson anymore. But you actually become a software professional. And I was a professional transportation and civil engineer. Okay. There were very definite ways to do standard work. And there were very definite ways to invent new things. So your teams need to understand as a group, how do we spot complexities in our work? And then what do we do when we see them? How early can we be involved as a group in the planning of the work that's coming up? The design thinking part of the work that's coming up, dealing with the customers, uh, prioritization, all of that stuff. And what I've loved, loved about COVID is all of the teams that I've worked with who used to be co-located, once they got remote, they all wanted to be part of the planning process earlier because their clarity decreased and it wasn't just that their clarity decreased, but they realized they never really knew anything to begin with. So in the book, we lay out exactly how to um, how you can run exercises to figure out what that culture is that you want to build and then visualize that in an obeya, and then use that information to manage work on a daily basis. And like I said, we've, we've done this with multi-billion dollar construction projects. So startups are really happy when they get six or seven million dollars. These projects were literally funded at two or three billion dollars. Okay. Stakes are very high. Deadlines are very definite. It is not a two pizza team. <laughs> this is hundreds of people interacting with the building of this thing. So I'm here to tell you that all of those things that you've ever been told about two pizza teams and blah, 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 blah is bunk. It's simply because you didn't have the right information at the right time for you to be able to act with confidence. And you can create that information. And that is where Agile needs to go. Absolutely. Agile should be about the respect for people and less about the two-week iterations and using specific pieces of software to manage your backlog. Having the right information at the right time to act with confidence. Uh, yep. That's a great summary. Of course, if you want to know more, you do have to read the book. The book is The Collaboration Equation. And uh, this is Jim Benson. Jim, where can people go to find out more about you and the work that you're doing? If people come to Modus Institute, M-O-D-U-S-I-N-S-T-I-T-U-T-E <laughs> dot, dot com, uh, you can sign up for the free community there. There's a free global community of lean, agile, um, behavioral economics folks running around talking every day about these things. It's completely free. I'm on there and you can talk to me anytime you want. I am the world's most accessible thought leader. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll definitely put the link on the show notes so that people can, can find it. Uh, Jim, it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much for your generosity with your time and your knowledge. It is always good to see you, my friend. Hi there, Agile friends. Thank you for sticking around. This year's first global summit dedicated to the product owner role in Scrum will have some amazing keynotes and two tracks filled with first-hand stories and experiences for product owners to learn more about that critical Scrum role. 
we'll have Roman Pichler, author and product expert, who'll be answering your questions and sharing the most important aspects of the product or a role. We'll also have Colleen Johnson talking about why roadmaps are probably making your life much harder than it needs to be and uh, what to do instead. This talk was quite a success in Agile Online Summit 2022 and Colleen has learned some new tricks, tools, techniques that she will share with us when it comes to roadmaps for the product on a roll. And we will also have Henrik Nibery, author of Scrum and Kanban from the Trenches, as well as one of the creators of the Spotify model. So come in and listen to his stories. And uh, we'll also have, of course, two tracks with uh, many more sessions and even some live sessions. The two tracks will cover practices every product owner should know, uh, where we'll be hosting conversations on topics that product owners need to be familiar with like product re backlog refinement planning and much more the second track will be on metrics measuring product and personal success as a product owner as product owners it's crucial to have a clear understanding of what are the metrics that drive success for us and of course also for the products and businesses that we work with and we need to continuously measure and optimize those metrics so in this track, we'll be sharing what's working and what's not in the area of managing success for product owners. We will also have the opportunity to network with our peers. It's a network event, of course. So get your tickets and join our Slack. Go to uh, bit.ly forward slash product owner 2023. That's all one word, all lowercase. As always, we will have free tickets and VIP tickets, which will give you long-term access to the content of this summit. So check them out at bit.ly forward slash product owner 2023, all lowercase, all one word. I'll see you on the summit floor. 